Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening here in New Mexico. It's July 8, 2019. This is episode 30 of the Grim Leftovers Show. And welcome to it, y'all. Um, <laughs> oh, man, I hope you're doing all, all doing all right out there. I hope you all had a good weekend and you're ready for facing the week for whatever it may hold for y'all. Uh, I guess I'm ready for it. That's not like for me the weekend and the week are that much different. I actually have more stuff to do on the weekends than I do during the week. So... Yeah, yeah, six of one, right? Uh, anyway, in my, my personal view on that matter. Uh, anyway, I'd like to say hi and howdy and welcome to all the folks in all the various places that the audio stream goes out to over there on freedomsnetwork.com. Hello to y'all over there on realliberty.org. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, if you're on the tune in or internet radio, welcome to you as well. And if you're here... Or, or on rlmradio.xyz, by the way. But if you're here in the chat room on irc.freenode.net, which you can access via reallibertymedia.com or rlmradio.xyz, or preferably by your own IRC client, then uh, you'll be here with all the great folks that are here that uh, chat along during the show, add comments and such as that as we go along. Now, tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different, just not that much different, but a little bit different. Um, I, I, I came across a posting there over on the minds.com, which, by the way, how do the minds people do? And the Twitter folk. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to do something a little bit different. I found a posting earlier today over there on the minds about the Milgram experiment. And um, it, it sparked a thought in my brain, which happens from time to time every now and then something will spark a thought in this brain of mine and i'll decide hey let me see what i can do with that all right anyway let me say hi to the folks here in the chat room uh, we got the uh, barman and the beetle mr cowboy tech and uh, myself and the moose girl are in there as well and Mose. we got uh, dc and anti and asmo and graham z uh, Don C is here again, and we got the Java Doctor and Meister Brow, Beaster Meister Brow Woodman. Uh, we got Kate and Rome's in the Vanna White Bot, Mister Vin E Vin, Vincent Easily, uh, Mister or not Mister, just the Weather Dork Bot gives you your weather here in the chat room. The Woodman himself and Miss Z, uh, Beth Z or Beth Z or Beth, depending on how you want to refer to her at the time. I believe she answers to all three. We got Phantom and Circle and Cyborg Noodle and uh, Frumpy and Grummet and huh? What? No, huh. He's Sometimes he's what? Today he's huh. We got JJ's and Kiss and Ponder Gunner. How many, how many Vinnies we got here today? All right, we got... <laughs> oh, there's, there's many Vinnies, so you never know. Um, <laughs> uh, where, where was I? Did, I? did I mention Frumpy? I think I did. Frumpy and Grummet and, uh, and uh, I think I'm repeating myself here. Pone Sauce and R Rufka. See, I don't know Rufka. Howdy, Rufka. Uh, we got Sock Puppet and the Smart Ass and Miss Van Mita. So, I believe most people are probably aware of the Milgram Experiment. And for those of you that aren't presently uh, f familiar with the Milgram experiment, by the time I'm done here, you will be. And you'll be familiar with some of my concepts of what the Milgram experiment uh, means in, in my way of thinking, of how it sparked a thought in my mind to bring this to the program this evening rather than uh, doing the... Uh, normal old links that I, I normally do but this is an old link uh the the one that it that was linked within there on the minds.com uh 
setup. Uh, this article, it just says it was updated in 2017. I don't know when it was originally written, but here it is. And it's posted on a website called simplypsychology.org by a guy named Saul McLeod, which was kind of an odd name, but that's all right. <laughs> And it's called the Milgram Shock Experiment. So I'm going to go through this. And then after that, I'll, I'm going to uh, try and go through some of the stuff. Well, hopefully all stay tuned as, as, as through this. Because the important stuff, at least the important stuff to me, uh, won't come until after I've gone through this and explained to you what this is. Or have this guy, Saul, explain to you uh, about the Milgram Experiment. Here we go. One of the most famous studies of, of obedience in psychology was carried out by Stanley Milgram, a psychologist at Yale University. He conducted an experiment focusing on the conflict between obedience to authority and personal conscience. Milgram, in 1963, examined justifications for acts of genocide offered by those accused at the World War II Nuremberg War Criminal Trials. Their defense was based on obedience, that they were just following orders from their superiors. The experiment began in July 1961, a year after the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. Milgram devised an experiment to answer this question. Could it be that Eichmann in his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders. Could we call them all experiment, uh, accomplices? Milgram asked in 1974. Milgram in 1963 wanted to investigate whether Germans were particularly obedient to authority figures as this was a common explanation for the Nazi killings in World War II. Milgram selected participants for his experiment by newspaper advertising for male participants to take part in a study of learning at Yale University. Study of learning. The procedure was, the, was that the participant was paired with another person and they drew lots out to find out who would be the learner and who would be the teacher. In the, in the case of this here, the learner is the person to be shocked, and the teacher is the person to do the shocking. The draw was fixed so that the participant was always the teacher, the participant being the person hired from the newspaper, and the learner was part of Milgram, was one of Milgram's confederates, pretending to be a real participant. The guy pretending to get shocked. Oh, we'll get to that. The learner, a confederate called Mr. Wallace, because they always called him Mr. Wallace to keep things normalized for the experiment, was taken into a room that had electrodes uh, attached to his arms. And the teacher and a researcher went into a room next door that contained an electric shock generator and a row of switches marked from 15 volts of slight shock to 375 volts Danger, severe shock to 450 volts, pretty much death at that point. The aim of the Milgram 1963 experiment was uh, interested in researching how far people would go in obeying an instruction if it involved harming another person. Stanley Milgram was interested in how easily ordinary folk could be influenced into committing atrocities. For example, Germans in World War II. The procedure. The volunteers who were recruited for the lab experiment investigation learning uh, uh, regarding ethics deception. Uh, participants were 40 males aged between 20 and 50 years old whose jobs ranged from the unskilled to the professional from the New Haven area. They were paid $4.50 just for turning up. At the beginning of the experiment, they were introduced to another participant who was a confederate of Milgram, the experimenter. Uh, 
they drew straws to determine their roles, learner or teacher, although this was fixed and the confederate was always the learner. Um, I keep losing my spot here. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, the confederate was always the uh, learner. There was also an experimenter dressed in a gray lab coat, played by an actor, not Milgram himself, but playing the, the part of the guy holding the experiment, the over, the overall guy that was going to instruct the teacher, the one that was going to be doing the shocking, to the learner, the guy that was in the room getting the shocks. So he was played by an actor who wasn't Milgram. Two rooms in the Yale Interaction Labor Laboratory were used, one for the learner with an electric chair and the other for the teacher and an experimenter with an electric shock generator. The learner, Mr. Wallace, was strapped to a chair with electrodes. After he has learned a list of word pairs given him to learn, the teacher tests him by naming a word and asking the learner to recall its partner pair from a list of four possible choices. The teacher is told to administer an electric shock every time the learner makes a mistake, increasing the level of shock each time. There were 30 switches on the shock generator, marked again from 15 volts of slight shock to 450 volts danger, severe shock, or death. The learner gave mainly wrong answers on purpose, and for each of these answers, the teacher gave him an electric shock. When the teacher refused to administer a shock, the experimenter uh, was to give a series of orders or prods to ensure that the teacher continued shocking the learner. There were four prods, uh, and if one was not obeyed, then the next experimenter, uh, Mr. Williams, would read out the next prod, and so on. Oh, where'd my thing go here? Okay, so the prods were, please continue, if you didn't follow that, the experiment requires you to continue. If you didn't follow that, it is absolutely essential that you continue. And if you didn't follow that, the ominous, you have no other choice but to continue. The result. 65%, two-thirds of the participants, the teachers, continued to the very highest level of 450 volts. All participants continued to at least 300 volts. Milgram did more than one experiment. He carried out 18 variations of this study. All he did was alter the situation to see how this affected the obedience. The conclusion? Ordinary people are likely to follow orders given by an authority figure even to the extent of killing an innocent human being. Obedience to authority is ingrained in us all from the way we were brought up. People tend to obey orders from other people if they recognize their authority as morally right and or legally based. The response to legitimate authority is learned in a variety of situations. For example, in the family, school, workplace. Milgram summed up the article the Perils of Obedience in 1974, writing, The legal and philosophical aspects of, the ob of obedience are of enormous import, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple experiment at Yale University to test how much pain an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to by an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the subjects, the participants, strongest moral imperatives against hurting others. And with the subjects, the participants, ears ringing with screams of the victims, the authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of this study, and 
the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Let me get a sip of water here. Milgram's Agency Theory. In 1974, Milgram explained how the behavior of his participants by suggesting that people have two states of behavior when they are in a social, social situation. The autonomous state, uh, people direct their own actions and they take responsibility for the results of those actions. The autonomous state. Or the agentic state. People allow others to direct their actions and then pass off the responsibility for those consequences to the person giving the orders. In other words, they act as agents for another person's will, for the authority's will. And, and if we, we look at agentic here, a uh, uh, description of agentic in yourdictionary.com, it says, uh, social cognition theory, perspective in which people are producers as well as products of social systems. And then it refers to back to Milgram's theory here. Milgram's theory about the agentic state which is the psychological state of the obedient subject, is when he or she is obeying authority. <laughs> Milgram suggested that two things must be in place for a person to enter the agentic state. The person giving the orders is perceived as being qualified to direct the other people's behavior. That is they are seen as legitimate. The person being ordered uh, or ordered about is able to believe that the authority will accept responsibility for what happens. And so the person doing it is not responsible for doing whatever it is they're doing, how, no matter how horrible it may be, because they have been ordered to do so by a legitimate authority figure. Agency theory says that people will obey an authority when they believe that the authority will take responsibility for the consequences of their actions. This is supported by some aspects of Milgram's evidence. For example, when participants were reminded that they had responsibility for their own actions, almost none of them pre were prepared to obey. In contrast, many participants who were refusing to go on did so if the experimenter said that he would take the responsibility. Milgram's uh, experiment variations. The Milgram experiment was carried out many times whereby Milgram in 1965 varied the basic procedure change the IV. Uh, by doing this, Milgram could identify which factors affected obedience for the DV. Obedience was measured by how many participants shocked the ma to the maximum of 450 volts. 65% in the original study would have gone ahead and killed whoever the person was for answering a question wrong, sitting on the other side of a wall. He would, they, they would go right, right on ahead, hit them with 450 volts, believing that it would either do them severe damage or kill them. And it was, they knew it was all just a, an experiment being done by some guy in a lab coat, but they were willing to go ahead and do that. Obedience <laughs> was measured by how many participants shocked to the maximum 450 volts. In total, 636 participants have been tested in 18 variation studies. Uniform. In the original baseline study, the experimenter wore a, a gray lab coat as a symbol of his authority, kind of like a uniform. Milgram carried out a variation in which the experimenter was called away because of a phone call right at the start of the procedure. The role of the experimenter was taken over by just a regular, regularly dressed ordinary person, a member of the public, a confederate, if you will, in everyday clothes, rather than the authoritative lab coat slash uh, uniform. The obedience level dropped by 
Still, 45% were willing to go ahead and do so. Even following the orders of just every everyday Joe. Changing the location. The experiment was moved to, to a set of rundown offices rather than the ex- impressive Yale University. Obedience dropped to 47.5%, suggesting that the status of the location affects obedience. Two teacher condition. When participants could instruct an assistant, a confederate, to press switches, 92.5% shock to the maximum of 40, 450 volts. While when there is less personal responsibility, obedience increases. This re- relates to uh, Milgram's agency theory. Uh, where, where'd I go here? Touch proximity condition. The teacher had to force the learner's hand down onto a shock plate when they refused to participate after 150 volts. Obedience fell to 30%. The participant is no longer buffered or protected from seeing the consequences of their actions. This next one, very interesting and and, um, quite telling, I would say. Social support condition. Two other participants, or Confederates, were also teachers, but refused to obey. Confederate 1 stopped at 150 volts, and Confederate 2 stopped at 210 volts. The presence of others who are seen to disobey the authority figure reduced the level of obedience to 10%. Significant. Still 10% are willing to go ahead and kill somebody <laughs> but still but better than 65 percent you know uh absent experimenter condition it's easier to resist the orders from an authority figure if they are not close by when the experimenter instructed and prompted the teacher by telephone from another room obedience fell to 20.5 percent many participants cheated and missed out shocks or gave less voltage than ordered to by the experimenter. The proximity of the authority of figure affects obedience. Critical evaluation of this uh, of these tests or experiments. The Milgram studies were conducted in a laboratory type condition, and we must ask if this tells us much about real life situations. We obey in a variety of real-life situations that are far more subtle than instructions to give people electric shocks, and it would be interesting to see what factors operate in everyday obedience. I'll be getting to that in a little bit. The sort of situation Milgram investigated would be more suited to a military context. Orne and Holland in 1968 accused Milgram's study of lacking experimental realism, Participants might not have believed the experimental setup they found themselves in and knew the learner wasn't actually receiving electric shocks. Uh, Milgram's sample was biased. Uh, The participants in Milgram's study were all male. Do the findings transfer to females? We don't know from this. Milgram's study cannot be seen as representative of the American population as his sample was self-selected. This is because they became participants only by electing to respond to a newspaper advertisement, which again, not really that much of a contributing factor, and I'll get to that too. Uh, Selecting themselves. They may have also have had a typical volunteer personality meaning they already enjoyed taking orders from somebody. Not all newspaper readers responded, so perhaps it takes this personality type to do so. Yet, in a total of 636 participants, which were tested 18 separate experiments across the New Haven area, which was seen as being a reasonably representative of your typical American town. Milgram's findings have been replicated in a variety of cultures, and most led to the same conclusions as Milgram's original study, and in some cases, see higher obedience ratings. However, Smith and Bond point out that, with the exception of Jordan, uh, Jordan, the majority of these studies have been conducted 
in industrialized Western cultures, and we should be cautious before we conclude that a universal trait of social behavior has been identified. And I can't really speak to that because I don't have experience in anything beyond the Western culture, basically the U.S. culture. Ethical issues. Deception. The participants actually believed they were shocking a real person and were unaware that the learner was a confederate of Milgram's. However, Milgram argued that allusion is used when necessary in order to set the stage for a revelation of certain difficult-to-get-at truths. Milgram also interviewed participants afterward to find out if they were uh, to find out the effect of the deception. Apparently, 83.7 said they were glad to be in the experiment and 1.3% said they wished they had not been involved. So, almost all of them, regardless of what they what they did, well, almost all of them, that's what uh, 7 eighths of them 83% Said, were, said, yeah, seven out of eight people said, yeah, I don't mind killing somebody because some guy in a lab coat told me to. <laughs> or to have refused to kill somebody uh, because they, they backed out because only 65%. So uh, seven eighths of 65% um, would, would have been the amount that said, yeah, I'll kill somebody if some guy in a lab coat says so. Projection of participants. Participants were exposed to extremely stressful situations that may have the potential to cause psychological harm. Many of the participants were visibly distressed. Uh, I'm sure I would have been visibly distressed, but I would not have gone through. I, I, I mean, I, I say that. And it's easy to say that sitting here in my chair and not being sitting there in a lab somewhere, uh, being told that go ahead and shock this person and and I'll take the responsibility for you killing him. I, so I personally believe, self, deep down in myself, that I would never, ever do that. I'm not in that situation. However, similar situations arise. <laughs> Signs of tensions, including trembling, sweating, stuttering, laughing nervously, that sounds like me, biting lips and digging fingernails in the palms of hands, uh, three participants held had uncontrollable seizures, and many pleaded to be uh, allowed to stop the experiment. In his defense, Milgram argued that these effects were only short-term. Well, you don't know that really, do you, Milgram? I mean, <laughs> after these people left, left your uh, view, you don't know what, what was going on there. Once the participants were debriefed and could see the Confederate was okay, their stress levels decreased. Milgram also interviewed the participants one year after the event and concluded that most were happy that they had taken part. However, Milgram did debrief the participants, participants fully after the experiment and also followed up after a period of time to ensure that they came to no harm. Milgram de debriefed all of his participants straight after the experiment and disclosed the true nature of the experiment. Participants were assured that their behavior was common, and Mil <laughs> which makes it okay, I guess, because it's common. Uh, and Milgram also followed the sample up a year later and found that there were no signs of any long-term psychological harm. In, the, in fact, the majority of participants, 837 said that they were just pleased as punch that they had participated. Right to... Oh, where'd that go? You're moving on me. Right to withdrawal. The BPS states that the researchers should make it plain to participants that they are free to withdraw from the experiment at any time, regardless of payment. Did Milgram give the participants the opportunity to withdraw? The experimenter gave four verbal prods, most of which discouraged withdrawal. Please continue. The experiment requires that you continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. And finally, the ominous, you have no other choice. You must go on. Milgram argued that they are justified as the study was about obedience, so orders were necessary. 
Milgram pointed out that although the right to withdraw was made partially difficult, it was made possible as 35% of the participants did actually choose to withdraw. Uh, Milgram's audio clips, uh, they, they got some clips here of, of some of the experiments that you can check out and listen to later on uh, if, if you prefer to or uh, whatever, if you desire to. I'm going to give you a link to the article. The, art, the link will be also in the post-show blog as well as a video or two of, of what happened there and some diagrams and such like that. So why do, do I bring all this up? Why do I, why am I talking about this crazy kind of stuff here? Well, simply, obedience to authority. And you may not see it as that. You may just think it's your own free will, your own drive, your own, your own ideas and beliefs pushing you to go ahead and do the things that you do. Go ahead and do things like vote, pay taxes, pay whatever other things you may be stuck paying, or to just support a point of view that you have heard based upon small amounts of information, whether or not those pieces of information be correct. Because to me, (laughs) from an experience that I, I went through last week, where I posted a comment on somebody's article and the responses that came back showed me a lot of thought control going on in the vast majority of the responses. Now, all responses weren't all on one side or the other. Uh, There was a mixture. And not only that, but they applied to me from some process, I don't know, certain thoughts that they thought that because I said this, that I was part of group A, group B, or group C, and and for that, they would dump their hate upon me, which I was perfectly fine with. I am, I am perfectly fine with. I don't really care what any of them thought. I just found it extremely interesting that from making a simple comment, that people will throw you into group A or group B or group C. And and from my, my uh, profile and previous postings that they could go and view, they could easily see, easily, very easily see that I was not part of any of those groups. But it didn't matter because I, I, I interfered with their thought process. I, I said something against what they believed via authority figures that they should believe and that I should go ahead and not, not uh, disagree with in any way. But I did. Th- this particular one was an article uh, posted on a website there. Uh, and it, what it said was that the uh, June was the hottest month ever recorded on earth and i pointed out in a my own humoristic way my my own belief it was humoristic way that these people that anybody believed that was basically a tool <laughs> and they are they're they're tools of 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 the establishment authority they're they're not actually there they're not actually thinking for themselves. They're not actually looking at the data. They're looking at information fed to them via sound bites. They're thinking that somehow that because these guys in lab coats said this is so, that it's so. And they point out, hey, we got 97% of these other guys in lab coats also said it's true. Without looking at the reasons behind why those other 97% of those guys said it was true. They didn't want to look at that. Some people that, that commented back referred to the fact that these people, in order to get funded, had to agree with the opinion that they were given rather than coming to the conclusions based upon actual data and not manufactured and manipulated data. A lot of people are now buying that. 
Now, I don't know exactly what makes them comfortable about buying that kind of storyline and thinking that information is correct. But then going on from that, I take, I take a look at people getting behind candidate A, candidate B, uh, measure A, measure B, whatever it is that they want somebody else to be able to control your life so that your life matches up with their beliefs or what they believe are their beliefs to be more accurate. So I see it now, you know, all over the place, and it's not just on Twitter, but obviously I, I view Twitter more often than not because the, the news comes fast and furious on there, and the opinions are wide and varied. It's, it's pretty good on minds, but nowhere near the pace of Twitter. But either way, on there you can find everybody picking up, you know, Hey, I like this guy because he said I'm going to get this free or he's going to do bad things to these people because they're not following the rules I want them to follow. They want somebody else to control everybody's lives and take the responsibility for what they want done to other people. Now, they would probably be happy to go ahead and impose these rules themselves as proven by the Milgram experiment. They would be happy to go ahead and let's say they're um, one of the border control people. They'd be happy to just shove all those people back, uh, no questions asked whatsoever, or line them up and shoot them depending on how radical the person is. If somebody else was willing to take the responsibility for them doing so. But they're glad to have somebody else go ahead and do it too because they think somehow from some little piece of information they've been given that that's a bad, these people are doing bad things. These people are harming them. They came here and they're harming you. So how are they harming you? Well, you see different stories there. See, some people say, well, they're taking our jobs. Well, I don't think they are. I'm pretty sure they're not. Maybe some are. Maybe some of your jobs are being taken. But then you got to take a look at yourself. If these people are coming across vagabonds, uneducated, unskilled, and they're taking your jobs, maybe you want to look at your life, see what you're doing. But no, you don't. Because why? That requires personal responsibility. You'd have to take responsibility for your own actions. Say, well, they're, they're sucking up all the welfare and the schools and the and the free food and going to the hospitals. Okay, fine. Why? Well, why, why are they doing that? How are they able to do that? Well, the people that you said, hey, please control my life, take care of everything for me, take the responsibility for whatever thing I put you there, I believe I put you there for. They said, okay, well, you put us here, now we're going to say, all this stuff is free for anybody that 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 we we deem eligible to get it and who's eligible well you're not <laughs> you're not eligible to get it but they are because they got nothing they come here they got nothing so why are you mad at them for coming here with nothing when the system they're coming into is something you voted for in the first place to give them everything because you don't have to take personal responsibility for it. So it's easy to want to do them harm in one way or another. Whether it's to line them up and shoot them, throw them in a cell somewhere, toss them back to where they came from, any of those things. And it's not obviously just about border stuff. It's about all these things. Public schools. You can look at it that way. You all wanted the public schools. Not you all, but in general, people all want the public schools. Why? Because that way they don't have to be concerned with education of their children. They don't have to care. They say this place here is it's an educational facility. Regardless of the fact that they're not really learning much there, and the stuff they are learning is probably not things that you would teach them yourself, you're just fine 
to send them there because, well, it's easier. It's easier than you taking care, taking responsibility for what your children learn, for what they know, for what information is handed to them, for what they're taught to believe in, for how they're taught to think because they're not taught to think there. They're taught to obey. That's what the system wants. The system wants people that will obey without thinking, without questioning, without taking personal responsibility. And it comes down to that, just in in situations all across the board, all across the board. And and I, I wish there was some good answer that, that I that I could think of to say this is how we change this this is how we modify it or stop it but I, I can't think of one because it is so broad based and it's been going on for so long as I pointed out those experiments took place in the early 60s those Milgram experiments uh, and, 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 the, and the people were at that point then as they had been for a long, long time. They see somebody that they believe is an authoritative figure giving them some kind of order or instruction and they follow it. And then at some point they may say, hey, this ain't right, I'm not gonna do that. But if the authoritative figure comes back to them and says, I'll take the responsibility, you go ahead and do it. You go ahead and do all this bad stuff because you're not responsible for it. And you go ahead and do it. You wanna look at that in a, from a military perspective, a military point of view? Joe Blow from Kansas or Kentucky or wherever, he's living there, he's growing up, he's 17, 18 years old, and he's like, hey, I got, I got no opportunity here, I'm living in the middle of nothing, I'm living in the middle of nowhere. And this guy, this army guy, came to our school and said, hey, we, we can give you a great career opportunity. You can learn stuff, you can get paid. It's a great time, come on, join us up. Uh, join up with us and, and, and we will take care of you. We'll feed you, we'll give you this education that you wanted. And you do, and you go and you sign up and you take their orders and you go through their boot camp or whatever kind of training they, they provide to teach you how to do the bad things they want you to do. And then, before you know it, they ship you off to some foreign land somewhere. You're armed with whatever weaponry they taught you how to use. And your job is to go out and kill people you never met for reasons you have no idea. But when you get there and you're on the ground, they're shooting at you. And your guy, whoever's your immediate authority figure, your sergeant or your captain, or I don't know how it all works, but I, I know basically stuff like that. They tell you, you better shoot back. <laughs> and so you do, you start shooting back. Because what else you gonna do? They're shooting at you because their guy on the other side has one of those authority figures too that's telling those guys to shoot at you. And so you shoot back. And you kill people or they kill your friends or they kill, you know, they knock your legs off or something horrible. Some lots of horrible stuff happens over there. Maybe you get poisoned by your own people, but they're higher up on the authority chain and they tell you, well, we, they don't even tell you that they did it. They'll they'll never admit that they did it, but uh, either way, uh, something terrible, terrible things happen. And if you do, if you are lucky, lucky enough to, make it out of that alive and hopefully in one piece, hopefully not not crippled physically for the rest of your life and you come back here, you're messed up. One way or another, you're messed up. Whether you admit the fact or not that you're messed up, you're messed up. Your brain can't really handle what happened. You understand that once you got over there and you were killing people for no reason that you understood, that it didn't f- match with your humanity, with your wa- your wanting to be a good person. And everybody wants to be a good person, don't they? I, I mean, I hope they do. 
I mean, it's, it's, I think more true than not true that people want to be good people. That people don't want to go, just go around killing random folks because they've been told to by some guy, but they do. So you come back and you're physically fine. You're okay. Your brain, well, maybe a little messed up to some degree on the ones that are better of you than others and not totally messed up. Now that, now that you're back and you, they taught you whatever they taught you, mostly military stuff, you got to figure out what you're going to do. Well, there's a group of folk out there looking for people just like you. And that's called the police department. They want you. You know how to handle a gun. You know how to handle groups of people. You know how to put chains on folks and throw them in cages. You are perfect for them. And so you do. And then you get there into those various police departments around the country. And you find out that these people are messed up too. They're corrupt. They're evil, many of them. And maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they're messed up because of what's happened to them prior in their lives. And, and, and they, they had been brainwashed into believing, following this authority chain from the top on down. And it, it's just, it's just wrong. It's, it's just, anyway. <laughs> so the Milgram experiment has gone wild. And, it, and, it, and, and I'd say it was always in the wild. And it's been that way for a long, long time. Well beyond the United States. Well prior to the United States, I should say. Uh, all the way back to the beginning, Mesopotamia. Depending how far back you want to go. Uh, as soon as one human was able to tell another human that they needed to do something. And they were able to show them that I am in control. I am in charge here. I'm going to not just tell you, but I'm going to tell this whole group of folk. This is what they need to do, and they need to do it to those folk over there because they're not part of us. They're not part of our group. They're not one of our family. They, they don't think like we do. We have to go after them. So that's been going on, basically, like I said, since the beginning of, uh, I don't know whether it was cavemen or, or aliens that came down and, and trained certain people uh, and mo modified them to, to be a certain way so that they would be useful subjects, useful slaves. Either way, that's how far it goes back. Uh, you could, uh, but the, the, this experiment, this Milgram experiment, showed exactly what, what, what happened. Now, I've seen a, various, a variety of uh, movies, documentaries, and uh, read plenty of articles and such about Milgram and the experiments that went on. And also the, uh, what was it, Stanford Prison Experiment, I think? Stanford, I'm pretty sure that's the one. Um, madness, it's madness. And it takes very little time to convince some group of people, and which if you're not familiar with that, that particular experiment, um, and I don't have any documents pulled up about it, I'll just try and remember a little bit that I can. A group of people were pulled in, just regular average folk. No, no... No people were shills in this. They were just average people pulled in to an experiment environment. Say 12 people. I, I don't know what the numbers were. Anyway, eight of those people were going to be designated as prisoners and four of them going to be uh, designated as guards. Again, I don't recall the exact numbers. Anyway, so the prisoners were put into, the, into, the, into their little cell areas and the guards were supposed to watch them and monitor them well it took very little time before those guards began abusing those prisoners and in severe ways and these any of and it was a random draw anybody could have been picked for a for, for a guard and anybody could have been picked for a prisoner and they they could have been like for example let's say they were in there for three days after a day and a half, maybe they would swap out a couple. But they didn't. That wasn't part of the experiment. The experiment was to see how long it would take for those guards to start acting authoritative and for those prisoners to start obeying them. Well, 
as prisoners and prisons do, they're not always very o obedient. <laughs> but the guards took on their roles very well uh, and, and wanted to do as much nasty stuff to those prisoners as they possibly could. There's something messed up in human nature. And as I said, I, I think most people do desire to be good and, and do desire to be friendly and nice to their fellow man and woman out there or other gender. <laughs> We're not going down that road. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I just think it's... Uh, I don't know what to think of it. I, I, I try to wrap my head around it, but as I've been told by a very good friend of mine, never try and understand the insane because, you know, that will just make you insane. <laughs> but I can't help it. I have to try and understand. I have to try and apply logic to what I see going on. And, and um, uh, you know, she's right. I, I should not try to understand them. I just don't know a way, a way around it for myself. So, uh, but anyway, if, if you're looking out there, you know, you in your everyday life and you see things going on that make, uh, that, that make you mad for whatever reason, these people doing this kind of thing and you don't like it, you don't agree with it and you're going to put a stop to it by voting, by putting new people in, by putting new laws in. You better understand and, and, and realize the greater repercussions of what it is you're doing. And you better take some personal responsibility for that act. That act. And you may say, oh, I take personal responsibility. But do you? Do you? I mean, you go down there and you, you cast your vote or you walk out on the street carrying a protest sign against Group A or Group B. You Really? Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're doing? Or would you be better off saying... All right, what makes this group or this person, because each individual, regardless of the, whether they're part of a group or not, because groups are just individuals, right? There's people in there. And each person is a person. They're an individual. They're not a group. I can't look at some person and say, hey, that guy's green. He's part of the green people. Well, maybe he is. He's a green person. So he's part of the green people, but he's his own person. And you can't hold everything that some green guy did against that guy. Can ya? Do ya? Will ya? <laughs> oh, Vinny says here, simply put, simply said, do you follow or are you led? He's a poet. Vinny's a poet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to wrap it up with that. I, I think you all understand and know well, where I'm coming from on this. I, I mean, if you've known me for any length of time or talked to me or listened to me or read stuff that I've written, I, I'm pretty sure that you know where I'm coming from on this. I, I don't like people being grouped. I, I do like people taking personal responsibility taking responsibility for their own actions, accepting that, whatever it may be, uh, standing up. If, if you've done something messed up, you say, yeah, I did something messed up. And either you stand by that or you say you're sorry for doing that. And if it's something that everybody else sees as messed up and you see as right, you're going to bow to pressure over, oh, well, you all see it wrong, but I see it and this is correct. So I would think, that if it is something that you see is correct and you have your reasons why you have your logic behind that then you would stand up for it regardless of the fact if, if every single other person was against you on it that you would stand up for it and if you did stand up for it other people might look at you and say this guy is either crazy or he's got a point and hopefully some of them would say huh, he has a point, or maybe he has a point, and they would start investigating for themselves, looking beyond the surface accusations thrown upon you to a deeper, to the, your deeper reasons for why something you did was correct or not. 
Just my point of view. But I stand by it. <laughs> anyway, folks, um, I, I know this has not been your uh, typical grim leftovers at all. But uh, I, I saw this today, and it, like I said, it, it sparked a thought in my brain, and I thought I would cover it. I don't know that I've covered it that well or that that completely, uh, but hopefully it it gained something for you. The, the Milgram experiment was, was, was quite an enlightening thing, as was the, the Stanford prison experiment um, and, and other experiments like that out there, because there are many others. And, and I'm sure you can find them if you, if you desire to look for them, to, to try and understand the way people are and maybe get beyond that and understand the why people are the way they are. Be kind if you can, folks. But most importantly, be you. Be you and be responsible for you. I don't mean to lecture. I'm not trying to lecture. I'm just telling you what I think. Anyway, uh, tomorrow, or well, I should say six hours from now, at uh, 2 a.m. Eastern time, uh, we'll be Flash Somebody doing his program in a perfect world. Maybe Vinny will stay up and, and, and do it with him. It is Vinny's show, too. Anyway, so that's at uh, 2 a.m. Eastern in a perfect world. Uh, then on Wednesday afternoon at her normal time, evening, 7 p.m. Eastern is Grammy in uh, Grammy's Rocket Chair. And uh, she does a great show uh, every Wednesday and Friday at that 7 p.m. Eastern time. On Thursday, again, it's Flash doing his solo program. His, it's intended to be solo program at 2 p.m. Eastern, and it's called 20% Off. Uh, Vinny, I don't think he's coming on Thursday, uh, I mean Friday, but uh, he will be coming on back on after the summer is over, uh, doing more Ponder Gander, I guess. I, I, he may change the name of the show. He does that sometimes. Uh, Vincent Easley, too. So uh, we'll look for him on Friday, but no guarantees there and probably not. And then uh, after Grammy's Friday evening show, we'll be, we'll be myself and the Mighty Moose Girl at 9 p.m. Eastern with, wait, 11 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. my time, uh, 11 p.m. Eastern with the Freakers Ball, followed on Saturday by the Dark Table at noon Eastern with Flash and generally a co-hostage, maybe two. I'll be back Sunday morning, Sunday morning my time, 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m., did I say p.m. on the dark table? I'm in a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. Noon, noon o'clock uh, Eastern uh, with the blues here and the trivia. We play trivia in the chat room. It's a lot of fun. And uh, followed up immediately after me, which is at 3 p.m. Eastern time, noon o'clock Pacific. Hal Anthony behind the woodshed opening up that big old can of whoop ass. If, the, by the way, you didn't hear Hal's show from yesterday, go check it out. It's it's you could you could find the archives on reallibertymedia.com uh, under the podcast heading or under the the, the uh, blog posts setting there or on the recent posts on the sidebar all kinds of places to find it you can also find us on BitChute on YouTube uh, various other places that that the uh, podcasts are located so check those out because it was a really really interesting and good show. Um, so do that, and then I'll be back again Monday, next Monday, with another Grim Leftovers. So uh, this one, uh, being a little different than normal, uh, instead of naming it with tags after that, I am just going to call this show The Milgram Experiment Gone Wild. <laughs> and this is episode 30, by the way. So uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Have a great evening, night, morning, wherever you are. Talk to you all later. Peace.